Okay, so, whoops. Official welcome to our November webinar. Um, if you haven't seen already, uh, take a look at the poll that I set up and then uh, this this month you get to choose the topic for, for next month. I have made a list of the topics that you typically suggest that we talk about. So uh, you can vote and whatever wins will do that next month. Uh, so for, for this evening, our topic is habit reversal training and specifically how to apply that to hair pulling. My idea with this webinar is to make it very practical. If you are thinking about using habit reversal training alone, uh, hopefully you will get uh, the basic principles and ideas on how to get started. And if you are in the program or if you're working with another therapist, this might help to give you a slightly different perspective on the process that you're going through. So hopefully it should be helpful to everyone. Uh, as I go through the slides, as always, please ask any questions you have uh, and I will get to them in the Q&A at the end. Um, so, well, this is me. There's no, uh, most of you, I suppose, know me by now. So there's no need to introduce myself uh, more than to say my name. So I'm Vladimir. Um, and this is what we will be talking about to, today. So first we will be talking about what is habit reversal training. Uh, we will go through all the important stages of habit reversal training, and I will tell you what the goal of each stage is, uh, how to get started, what is it that you should aim to achieve, and what are some of the mistakes that you should try and avoid. I will talk about habit reversal training as a part of the Trick Stop program, just briefly. Uh, for those of you who are in the program, I would like to tell you sort of uh, what the place of, of this, uh, this technique is and how you can best use it with the rest of the program. Then I will be giving some tips for those of you who are trying to do this alone. We'll talk a little bit about the limitations of HRT so, so that you can have proper expectations before you start in terms of what is it that you can hope to achieve and what is it that's not really realistic to, to accept, expect with HRT. And afterwards, as always, we'll go to the Q&A section. So let's get, so I have to move myself to the left side because, oh, okay, it's just the HRT, let's see. So what is habit reversal training? So it's a type of behavioral treatment that's aimed specifically at treating repetitive behaviors. So you can use successfully, you can use it successfully with uh, problems like hair pulling or skin picking or stuttering or nail biting or ticks. TMJ disorder, stuttering, so a variety of, of problems. As a therapist, I've used it for all kinds of BFRBs and it's proven to be quite successful for what it's supposed to do. I've never used it for stuttering. I know from research that it's effective, but I, so clinically, I just never, never had a chance to do that. So I, from, from my experience as a therapist, I know that it works very well for hair pulling and skin picking, as well as for ticks. So for these things, I can guarantee that you can expect to, to get, get results. So it, it, it can be used a lot. And uh, this evening when I present how it works, it's, it's aimed for you if you want to use it as a standalone treatment. But more often than not, it's combined with other forms of treatment. This is because of the limitations that it has, and I will be talking about that a little bit in the end. Mostly when we combine it with other treatments, those are CBT-based treatments, but because habit reversal is just a, a behavioral intervention, you can pretty much implement it with any approach to therapy. So if you have a therapist, it doesn't matter what type of therapy they practice, you can easily implement habit reversal in your work together. There's a form of habit reversal training that's slightly simplified and it functions as a help self-help program and it's called decoupling. I will be basically telling you how to do decoupling as well. Um, so we have studies that show that uh, it's eff effective for hair pulling. So it's one of the treatments that have been empirically validated. So we know scientifically that it works for most people. So there are five stages of habit reversal training. It might sound complicated, so I'm going to go right ahead and simplify it. For all practical purposes, you can think about habit reversal training as having two components only. 
that those are the first two on the list here. So awareness training and response training. Compliance, relaxation, and generalization are important parts of it, but I wouldn't exactly call them stages. The first two should be done in this specific order, whereas the rest you can implement at various parts where, where you feel ready to start, but in general, the sooner the better. We will go through them all individually, and then I will tell you what the purpose is and how to implement it. But just remember that the first two stages are the most important ones, and you should always do them in order. So first awareness training, then response training. Relaxation and all this you can start from the very beginning, but awareness training must precede response training. So that's just one simple rule to remember. So let, let, let's now go over all the stages briefly and, and see how to implement it. So you start with awareness training. Awareness training is basically everything that you do to observe your behavior and become more aware of it. There are several reasons why we need awareness training. First, in order to apply and use any techniques, you need to be aware that you're about to pull. Because if most of your pulling is mindless, you're really not going to remember on time to use any of the techniques. So first comes awareness so that you know that you're pulling or that you're about to pull. And then come the techniques. That's one reason. The second reason is uh, that you basically with awareness training, you're also gathering data. So you're learning about hair pulling. You're learning about what your triggers are, um, what your sort of what is the context in which you pull. Uh, you're learning about uh, when your pulling is focused, when your pulling is, is uh, mindless. And also you're hopefully learning about your emotional response prior, during, and after pulling, as well as the thought patterns that, that you have. So to gather, to gather the data is extremely important uh, for several reasons. Most of all, and basically the only reason you need to remember for, for HRT specifically, is that you cannot choose a good technique without understanding all the components of the process of how you pull. Different types of pulling, different circumstances, different contexts will require different technical approaches. So in order to actually select techniques that work for you, you have to do this part well. The reason I'm saying this is because most, most of the time when we have new clients in the program or when I work with clients outside of the program, one thing that they will always tell me is, can we just skip through this awareness training part because it's really tedious or, you know, I don't really need this. I'm, I'm super introspective. I'm extremely mindful. I'm a fast learner and really a bunch of other things. And the, the only response that I have for all of them is just no. No one is that mindful. No one is that introspective. Awareness training is really a necessary component. And yet to see a person successfully complete a trick stop or specifically habit reversal training without proper awareness training. So it is extremely important. Any reason that you can think that you don't need to go through it, just mark it off as resistance right away. So how do you go about doing this self-monitoring and awareness training thing? Uh, so the, the goal is to observe your behaviors and your feelings and your thoughts. So any way that works for you in general is a good way. Uh, there are several things that I like to sort of suggest to people. One is to do self-monitoring. If you're in the program, you're probably using the app already. The app, however, is free and anyone can download it and use it. It's called TrickStop and it's an app specifically designed for you to self-monitor. The reason why this is important is because the app offers you a structured approach. So it tells you exactly what you need to to gather in terms of the data you might need. So it's quite comprehensive and it gives you a structure to work with. Uh, you can also use a journal or you can, you can use a spreadsheet, you can use a piece of paper, really anything. An app is useful because it's always on your phone. I don't typically carry my journals around with me, but my phone is for better or worse always with me. So it's, it's useful and it's practical. The second thing you can do to kind of reinforce the process of self-monitoring is to start a mindfulness practice, whether formal, formal or informal. Formal means that you sit a certain number of minutes every day and meditate. Informal mindfulness means that you select an activity and then do it mindfully. When we do self-monitoring and when you want to 
to strengthen it with mindfulness, you use informal mindfulness in specific contexts. So let's say you notice that you tend to pull your hair a lot while you read or while you watch TV. So what you will do is you will give yourself a task, so set an intention specifically to be aware of your hand, for example. If you pull with your right hand, then make it your right hand. To be aware of your right, right hand the entire time you're watching TV. So this will have several effects. So first of all, you will notice your hand moving, so you will be more aware of pulling. And second of all, you will actually likely pull less because you will be aware of what's happening before sort of the urge to pull becomes so intense and strong. So just by introducing a little more awareness into your behavior, you're likely to cut down on pulling. Another, well, it's not a thing, it's a person that works well, is to find an accountability partner. I will talk about this more towards the end, but what I mean here is any person that is close to you, around you, or you live with. Uh, so how can they help you? By pointing out your pulling, they can help you become aware of the mindless aspects of pulling because automatic pulling or mindless pulling, pulling or unconscious pulling, any way you want to call it, is really very difficult to pin down and understand and be aware of. Because by definition, it's something that you're not aware of as it's happening. If you live with someone or have someone close to you, this person can find a way to subtly and gently point out that your hand is kind of moving towards the pulling side. Before you declare a person your accountability partner, it's very important that you have a conversation with them and explain how is it that you want to be pointed out that you're pulling. The goal is not to shame you. The goal is not to guilt you into stopping. The goal is not to make you feel uncomfortable. So sometimes it's people might not like to, you know, have, to have it pointed out directly, like you're pulling now, stop. Sometimes a keyword will work or a gesture, like someone can hold your hand or touch your shoulder or whatever you feel comfortable with. So anything that's subtle enough and gentle enough, but that gives you the right information. So this is why it's important that you kind of explain to people what is it that, that you're going through and to give them some basic information so that they know how to behave. This tends to be super effective if you trust the person and if they know the right way to point it out. Another, another thing that you can do is use bracelets. Uh, so by this, I mean either those habit aware bracelets, which are very good to point out the, the mindless pulling, or just very heavy or noisy bracelets, because anything that will be different than what your arm normally feels is more likely to draw your, your attention there. So if, you're, if you have a bracelet that makes noise, for example, every time you move your hand, you're spontaneously going to switch your attention to that because it's just not a typical situation. So they serve as kind of an awareness enhancers, let's say. So that would be the basics of the first stage. How long should you be self-monitoring? I really don't know what to tell you, but as long as possible. In the Trick Stop program, first two weeks are entirely dedicated solely to awareness training. So everything, all our correspondence, all our communication, uh, everything you do as your assignment is directed towards awareness training. If you're doing it alone or with your therapist, you can do it even longer. Sometimes in trick stop, people will do it a little longer as well. Typically, the way I go about this is that I instruct clients to self-monitor for any type of pulling in the first two weeks. So literally anything and as much as you can and preferably in real time. So if you're using the app, as soon as you notice the urge to pull or as soon as you know, notice you're pulling, immediately write it down. So for two weeks, do everything and monitor as much as you can. After two weeks, what I propose is that you do a kind of review of all the data that you've gathered and then either find a troubling context or, for example, focus on mindless pulling. So then you narrow down you're pulling to those areas where you need more awareness. So as you progress and as you do it longer, you can narrow down what you monitor only to those things that you feel are kind of more important or something that you want to specifically target first. So at least two weeks longer is also okay. Once you have your two weeks at least of, of monitoring, once you're kind of aware of pulling 
and, and can recognize it coming, that would be the time to take the data and then review it once again and use the data that you've gathered so that you can select appropriate techniques. In habit reversal training, we use two main types of techniques. If you have a therapist, you can come up with a number of other techniques, and I will usually suggest the clients implement other things as well. I will talk about some of them later, but that's, these are the two basic classes of techniques here. So one are competing responses, and the second one are called, is called stimulus control. Uh, competing responses are essentially new habits that you intentionally introduce so that they would slowly replace pulling. So what we're doing is we're not overpowering the urge, we're not suppressing it, we're not pushing it away, we're not fighting with it, we're simply redirecting it onto something else. The idea behind this is to provide a habit that is healthier and that causes less damage or rather no damage at all. So that would be the goal of a competing response. Then we have stimulus control techniques. Uh, so stimulus control is essentially anything that you do to alter your environment so that you minimize or remove triggers. So a competing response is something that will help you um, work through the urge that has already arisen, so an urge that is present, whereas stimulus control is supposed to reduce or eliminate the urges altogether. An example of a competing response would be to, for example, sit on your hands or do a breathing exercise or, for example, like interlock your hands like this or use, you know, uh, squeeze toys, fidget spinners, worry stones, whatever, whatever would work for you. The stimulus control would be, for example, to cover the mirrors if you, let's say, pull in the bathroom, to use a timer, to wear gloves, finger covers, band-aids, um, socks, you know, depending on where you pull, hats. So anything that would physically prevent you from pulling. The way you select these techniques is not to just choose whatever seems the easiest. And it's also not about choosing a huge number of techniques. Very often I see these two mistakes in the program. People will either select one thing, and that's usually something that they, the, the first thing that they saw that seemed like it would be the least sort of least difficult to introduce as a habit, something that doesn't require a lot of effort. This is not quite good because when you select one, one technique to cover all the places where you pull, it's not likely that it will work because pulling is rarely limited to just one context. For example, what's appropriate for watching TV or before you go to bed might not really be appropriate for work meetings. And you might as you sometimes might pull in both of these situations. So ideally you will have one competing response per every major context where you pull. Another problem that people, the, another issue that I see that people, that people sort of come up with is that they will select 10 techniques. So they will, when, when you go, when you use trick stop, you have a list of, of suggested techniques. And then they will just sort of copy paste half of that list and say, so here, this is what I will be doing. This is also not a very efficient way to go about this because if you're supposed to introduce 10 new habits at the same time, that's pretty much a guarantee that you will fail at every single one of them. This is why I prefer to start with two or three competing responses, and then on a weekly basis, you can review what's effective and what's not if you journal and kind of keep track of, of what works and what doesn't work. And then you will see which ones need to be replaced or altered or just somehow modified so that you make them more effective. Uh, so this is important. And then another thing that's important is that once you start with response training, it's not sufficient to just select a competing response. So I see a lot of you raising your hands. Uh, instead, it's much more effective if you, uh, if you just type in your, uh, your question and I will, I will get to it later. Um, so yeah, so one thing is to find an appropriate competing response for, uh, for every context that you pull in. And the second thing is to approach them as new habits. 
So you can go back to our webinar if you have some free time from, when was it? It was September. So in September, we talked about how to establish new habits. And I mentioned some of these techniques back then as well. So if you want to see how best to introduce them as new habits, you can go and check that webinar. But for, for our purposes here, it's sufficient to say that repetition is the key. So you cannot apply competing responses only when you feel the urge to pull. In fact, that is really not the best way to establish a habit. Instead, let's say if you typically pull, well, apparently today I'm all about watching the TV. So if you're watching your TV and then this is where you pull, you will use the competing response every time you're in that context. So every time when you sit and watch TV, you immediately start using your competing response. Because for a competing response to be your natural response to the urge to pull, it needs to be established in a certain context. So that when you intentionally start switching from pulling to a competing response, your mind will immediately make the link. So let's say you, you, you decide to use an infinity cube while you watch TV. If you keep playing with it, when, you, when the urge to pull arises, it will not take a long time for you to train your mind to immediately go to the infinity cube instead of pulling. When it comes to stimulus control, it's slightly different because well, let's say you still need to use the same thing to make it a habit if you're using a timer, but if you're going to cover the mirrors in the bathroom, the mirrors are covered and you're pretty much done. If predominantly the way you pull is unconsciously, then using stimulus control might be a better way to go about this because it will kind of eliminate the triggers and then you can slowly work on awareness a little longer. Once you established your, your responses, well, I should be moving to the next slide, but up oh, there it is. You essentially enter a new stage in the process, and this stage is called compliance training. Compliance training is really uh, all about making sure that you don't stop using the habits that you're introducing so that you keep using the techniques, but also at the same time to learn more about pulling and to kind of identify any points of resistance and work around them and work with them. I will explain this in, in a little more in just a minute. So the first thing you do with compliance training is to introduce reward and validation systems. Again, I've talked about this a little more in, the, in our webinar in September. So I'm going to just briefly reiterate. If you're going to establish a new habit, Validation is the key. If you get upset with yourself for not doing something and you know, just use a lot of negative self-talk and feel bad, your brain knows that it's not supposed to do something, but it really doesn't know what is it that it's supposed to do. So being furious with yourself for pulling really just causes you to feel bad, but it doesn't give any kind of constructive instruction to your mind. When you incorporate different validation systems and you reward yourself in a very kind of targeted systematic way, you're actually directing your mind towards what it's supposed to be doing. So this, is, this is a very important point. I usually suggest that clients incorporate at least two or even three different tiers of, of validation. So there should be something that you can for example, like some kind of positive self-talk or just a little bit of kindness, you know, just acknowledge your successes every time you apply competing responses correctly. So that would be a basic thing. Then what you can do is you can introduce a reward for every day without pulling. So 24 hours without pulling, and then you reward yourself with something. Rewards should be pretty much kind of appropriate to the level of achievement. And then you can have like three days or a week. And then that should be even a greater reward. This may sound silly and may sound like I'm talking about giving treats to a puppy, but our minds really work this way. When you reward yourself, those circuits in your brain remember that you did something well. And we change much faster when we associate things that we do well with some kind of pleasure. So once you connect these two, you're reinforcing that what you're doing is good. Sometimes it's sufficient to just congratulate yourself verbally, 
but I prefer to use validation that's slightly less verbal because the change that we're going for isn't exactly intellectual, you know. If, there, there, if change was just logical, then we really wouldn't need therapy. We would just self-correct like machines. But the, the, the parts of us, uh, those parts of us that require change usually don't speak very much. So you need to kind of talk to them at their level. So the, some, let's look at it this way. Sometimes if you need comfort, uh, people will say, oh, I really, I know how you feel. And sometimes that wouldn't do much for us. But if they hug us, that kind of, that speaks in a different language. And then that can really comfort us. And the same goes for this. So if, it's, if you're trying to make something repetitive, you're trying to make it a habit. So you're trying to make it something that you do unconsciously, essentially. So you have to validate yourself on that level as well. Uh, follow the pace of change that you have. So you do not change as fast as you want to change. You change only as fast as you can. And I should have put this in red and maybe put it on every slide. Everyone who wants to change wants to do it very quickly. And we kind of live in a culture that promotes very fast solutions. Like you, no one wants to spend years contemplating something. People want a hack so that they can move on quickly. The only trouble with this is that it doesn't work. So change takes time. And the, if you kind of want to change faster than you really can, all you will end up with is frustration. And then when you get frustrated, you're going to get angry at yourself. When you get angry at yourself, you're going to have urges to pull and you're going to pull even more. So by pushing yourself more than you can, you can actually do in the moment, you're essentially perpetuating pulling, not to mention negative self-image because it's really hard not to feel like a failure when things don't go the way we plan. So observe how fast you can actually change and then demand a little more of yourself but not that much more that you end up frustrated and you know, end up failing. Identify points of resistance. So in psychotherapy, resistance is one of the sort of major topics that we talk about. Because even though everyone comes to therapy with an idea that they want to change, things are never really that linear and straightforward. People sabotage themselves all the time. And oftentimes we're really not ready for the kind of change that we want. Going back to the second point here about the pace of change. So even though obviously since you're here and listening to this, and if you want to try habit reversal on your own, if you're in therapy or whatever else, obviously you want to change. That doesn't mean there will be no resistance. People will often report, uh, like when in, in the program when they, when they start with, with uh, habit reversal, they will send me messages like, I can't believe this, I practiced the technique and then yesterday I just chose not to use it. There was one moment when I told myself, you will either now use the uh, stress ball you have or you will pull. And then I told myself, go and pull. These things happen all the time. It's very easy to sort of feel like a failure in that moment. But for me, that's really just a learning opportunity. That is resistance. You had, you've had, you, you, you were standing at the crossroads thinking, should I do things the same way or change? And you've chosen not to change, even though you had the solution. So that's a point of resistance. When they're this obvious and flagrant, they're very easy to spot. But resistance often works in very mysterious and kind of subtle and devious ways. So often people will say, well, I was going to use my competing responses, but then I just forgot. Like I remembered them one moment and then they just evaporated from my head. Sometimes we are forgetful, and of course, sometimes we'll forget accidentally. But sometimes forgetting to use something all the time is a resistance, it is a form of resistance. And then also at other times, we can use legitimate reasons, like legitimate difficulties that we have to resist change. Sometimes people will say, well, I would really like to, but I'm kind of very busy. Like I have three children and, you know, a husband who's my fourth child. So it's very hard for me to practice competing responses. This is true, but this is really not the reason why a competing response doesn't work. This just means that you've chosen those responses that are not very easy for you. Sometimes I, uh, very often I find that BFRBs overlap with ADD or ADHD. And then people will say, well, you can't expect me to 
to focus on orthopedic responses because I have ADHD and then I have trouble focusing. And that really is a legitimate thing. It, obviously, yes. However, and, and then I say, well, have you tried to seek treatment for ADHD? Like, have you seen a therapist or maybe uh, a psychiatrist or someone who can prescribe you medication? And then I get the answer like, well, no. So there you have something that is a legitimate problem, but then you don't seek a solution to the problem. And furthermore, you say the fact that I have this problem for which I'm not trying to find a solution is something that's stopping me from changing here. This is the point where you kind of see that it can also be resistance. It's not always, actually most of the time it's not. I'm just kind of giving an example of what, how something can be a proper reason, a difficulty that you actually have to deal with, but you can also kind of use it as resistance. This is very obvious when people try to implement mindfulness. Uh, everyone wants to practice mindfulness, but no one really wants to practice mindfulness. So people will say they want to, and then they will read 17 books on mindfulness, but they will really never sit down and practice it. And then they will tell me, yeah, yeah I'll start next week, or I'll, I'll start with my daily practice just tomorrow. And then they say, well, I was kind of going to, but then I got very tired after work, so I just decided to sit and watch TV, and then I pulled. Uh, not having time to do something that takes 15 minutes a day is just on the face of it resistance. Because if you look at the time you spend scrolling through your social media, you'll see that it's far more than 15 minutes and the benefits you get from scrolling through social media and actually doing meaningful psychological work, not really comparable. Watching TV, for example, is something that most people spend hours doing and they often pull while they do that. And yet somehow they're reluctant to give up 15 minutes of it. That can also be resistance. So keep an eye on this. Uh, this is another point where journaling really works well, because if you journal very frequently, when you review your journals, you will see sort of common themes repeating themselves and it will be much easier for you to spot what's resistance and what isn't. Communication with your therapist is also a good place where you can see what's resistance and what isn't. Because just saying something or writing something for the 10th time, even with, with, without the explicit feedback, it will become clear. So make sure also to follow up on how efficient the techniques that you use are. If they're not efficient after, let's say, a week or two or of diligent and regular use, replace them. So one thing is, is to struggle to introduce it as a habit, and then you sometimes forget to use it. But if you do use it and it doesn't work, find something else. It's also useful to think about having backup techniques, uh, meaning that you will sometimes find techniques that will work for most, let's say, normal situations. But when you're under additional stress or when something urgent happens, something unpredictable, it's really useful to have a technique that's super efficient, even if it's not very easy to use, but you need something like with, let's say, extra strength for you. And also learn from failures. Habit reversal training is not that easy. It sounds simple enough, like just notice patterns, introduce habits, make sure you repeat them. But you will fail. Everyone does. There is nothing inherently wrong in failing because there is no change without failing. When you fail, if you fail to learn from the failure, then that's really what failure is. If you examine the situation and learn from what you did wrong, then it's not quite a failure. Like, so just learn from it. That's very important. Because once we fail, we often fall into this trap of, of just this kind of vicious cycle of very negative self-talk, which then leads to feeling guilty and anxious and, and fearful, and then just makes things worse, but we don't learn anything. So that's not a very productive approach. So immediately when you start working on, on habit reversal, just tell yourself that you will fail. It will happen, it's not good, but it's fine. And when it happens, be prepared, be nice to yourself. Once you, once you calm down, go back, examine the situation and see what you can do differently. Another, thing that you don't have to wait until stage four, you can start from the very beginning, is relaxation training. This sounds fancier than it really is. In reality, what it means is that you need to find something to deal with the anxiety and tension. 
So hair pulling often functions as a way to self-soothe or to process stress or in general to, to avoid or, or avoid processing difficult experiences. So if that's the function of pulling for most people, not for all people, but for most people, yes, uh, a part of the treatment should be to address the function. So you should implement something that is relaxing for you. Again, don't look at what's easy to implement, look at what works. This, this is a very important distinction. Uh, some of the things that will most commonly work would be grounding exercises, mindfulness, PMR, progressive muscle relaxation, breathing exercises, there's so many of them out there, yoga, or essentially you can also complete programs like stress and anxiety management, for example, MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's an eight week program that once you complete it, you'll learn quite a number of tools to help you relax and manage your stress. But it doesn't have to be anything fancy or official. Uh, many people like to use like adult coloring, coloring books. Um, what else could you like solving puzzles? For example, the, just a personal example. One thing that I really like to do is uh, play solitaire or patience with cards, but I don't do it on my laptop because when I don't work, I don't want to be staring at the screen. I have two decks of cards and I found this really difficult type of solitaire. It's called the German solitaire and you do it with two decks of cards and then I spread them out, play some relaxing music and I don't exist for half an hour. So that like whatever that is for you, painting, journaling, singing, screaming, Whatever it is, implement it on a regular basis. The reason being that you need something to self-soothe. So it's not something that you will do only when you feel upset. It's, it's an actual new routine that you have to implement. Sometimes instead of relaxation training, what will work best is to work on the like your work-life balance and find a way to, to fix that. Sometimes it's about learning how to set boundaries because people tend to get very stressed when they take too much on and when they don't know how to say no to other people. Uh, sometimes it's changing your approach to work if that's what's stressing you. Right? So all these things can reduce your anxiety levels and that's the goal. So see what works best for, for you, try out different things and then keep, keep what works and implement it regularly. When it comes to these things, uh, since, I'm a, since I'm a mindfulness teacher as well, that's something that I can confidently speak about. There's a lot of resistance also around mindfulness. So it's very easy to fall off the wagon, like skip one day, two days, and then next thing you know, you haven't done any mindfulness in a month. So that's something also to, to be mindful of in, in the same way that I explained in compliance training. It's literally the same thing. And then after you've implemented all this, you can slowly start to expand where you use the habits that you've acquired. So if you remember, I said that when you choose competing responses, you should do that from, from within one context. So if you have two or three contexts where you pull, you will select two or three competing responses. Uh, the reason why it's good to implement them in a certain context is because, of course, they're more likely to be efficient, but also they're much easier to establish as a habit. Our habits are all contextual. So habits are, we learn things more easily if we can attach it a certain part of our life or stack it on top of already existing habits. So this is very good to get you started successfully. But once something becomes a habit, so when you, let's say, if you want to use a spinner ring, and then once you start using it at work, and when it becomes an established habit at work, you can slowly start seeing where else it might work. Because we want to be very efficient with this. The goal is not to swamp you with 65 techniques and then when you need to use one, you can't really choose, you can't really decide which one is the best one. So it's, you know, we want to be minimalist in our approach. It can be a difficult technique, but if it's just one or maybe two, that's very, that's very good. So you can try and expand and see where else they might be useful slowly and systematically. So write about that, talk to your therapist about this, see if you can figure it out together. And then slowly you will have fewer tools to deal with a bigger, sort of wider rather set of circumstances. And of course, practice, practice, practice. There's no way around this. Stimulus control and, and competing responses are tedious that way they require constant attention and practice. But one thing that I would advise you not to do, it just occurred to me, um, 
don't read those articles that say just 21 days or 39 days or whatever they say, and then you'll have a habit. This is very individual. Scientifically, we don't really have a set number of days. There have been studies that have tried to see what works, but different studies have given different results, which essentially means that we all have our individual times that we need to establish habits. I know people who struggle for months to establish a habit. For example, I'm very fortunate in that department. I can just tell myself from tomorrow you'll be doing this every day, and then I just, just do it. Again, I, I'm very fortunate in that department. Most people struggle with this a little more, so be very patient. And even when it seems like something is a habit, the moment when you decide that you, don't, you no longer need to intentionally use it, chances are it will start disappearing. So really just keep vigilant. Set, put reminders everywhere, uh, use, for example, you can even use just a post-it note. You don't have to write anything on it. If for you, a post-it note is a reminder that you need to use competing responses or stimulus control, just put them everywhere where you need them. So use these subtle reminders. I also like to recommend that in the beginning, at least, people use competing responses that are physical objects. Uh, this is good because uh, you will have a reminder sort of the object is also a reminder. When you see a, a stress ball sitting next to the chair where you sometimes pull, just seeing the stress ball is a reminder to practice competing responses. So um, in trick stop, habit reversal training is one part of what we do, but only one part. It's actually a little less than, than half of the program. It, you use it from, well, you use it the whole time, but you explicitly work on habit reversal training from sessions one through three. So you start with awareness training and then you move on to applying the techniques pretty much like I described it here, where of course in, in trick stop you have communication with the therapist so you can tweak and adjust and address any issues as you go along. After week three, we supplement it with another form of therapy, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, which is CBT plus mindfulness. So that way you get more advanced techniques to work with difficult experiences, to work with thoughts and emotions, because triggers are not just external events, our thoughts can also be triggers. So with the ACT part, you also learn to deal with these. That way you get a fuller package, let's say. Um, the self-monitoring logs that you create as part of habit reversal training is something that we use to gain further insight into why you pull and to sort of understand what the psychological backbone might be. Sometimes it's something that's possible to resolve in the format of trick stop, sometimes not. But in that case, we create, a, let's say, a map or, or we discuss what is it that you can do on your own after the program or parallel to it. If you're going to try and do this alone, so here's some, I already pretty much, I think, explained how to start, but these are some tips and based on what I see the people do wrong or where they, where they typically fail. Use the app. So the Trick Stop app is free. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to register anywhere. Just download the app and you can use it. The app can generate a PDF with all your logs in it. So it makes it very easy to review the logs. And you can then easily spot patterns when everything is in one place. Log in real time as much as you can. It's not equally effective when you take some time in the evening and then write down all the instances of pulling during the day. You might remember what triggered it externally. You might remember where you were, but you're very, very unlikely to recall how you've been feeling and what you were thinking about at the time, especially if we're talking about unconscious pulling. So as soon as you notice you're pulling or as soon as you feel the urge, immediately log. I understand that this is not always possible, especially if you pull like many times, but briefly throughout the day, it can be really tedious. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, you can slowly uh, kind of reduce monitoring to specific areas, but in the beginning, try to do as much as you can. No one's asking for perfection, just do your best. Uh, I suggest that you take, uh, especially if you journal, uh, or even if you use just the app, that's also fine, but if you, if you journal, that's even better. Take one day during the week, let's say on Sundays or whatever days is your day to rest, and then take one hour or so and review your logs and review your journal entries and try to spot any themes that keep repeating themselves because they're likely very important. 
if you have a hard time re uh, recognizing your emotions, uh, write down all the body sensations instead of emotions when you log and then see which sensations tend to occur over and over again. So that analyzing your logs is a way to understand. So it's a way to understand what triggers it. It's a way to, to choose good techniques, but it's also a way to learn sort of what is it that actually triggers you? How, how is it that you relate to yourself? And what is it you feel most of the time? So it can offer you a lot of useful stuff to work on. Um, you can also find a partner. This doesn't have to be anyone you live with. It can also be a person that struggles, struggles with pulling or some other BFRB. Uh, and then you can go through the process together. You can meet online and then you can kind of analyze journals for each other and discuss about, the, about your triggers, maybe even compare techniques and see what works for who because in, in my experience, I learn a lot from my clients because uh, they will think of competing responses that would never occur to me. So the, everyone has sort of their own strange little way of thinking. And then, you know, as we all come up with different solutions to the same problem, the more we communicate with each other, the more creative we'll get. So having someone who has a similar struggle is really good because A, you can kind of see what works better. B, you will get the kind of understanding that outside of someone who has a similar struggle or maybe your therapist, most people can't really provide. A lot of the times people will tell you just to stop or that's not a big deal, you can just deal with it on your own or you know, if you don't wanna pull, then don't pull and things like this. It's really hard for people to understand that it's not something you can just you know, snap your fingers and decide not to do. So that also can create a kind of safe space you can where you can really just talk and, and be emotional and vulnerable. And that's a really healthy thing to do. So that's, that's something that can additionally reinforce habit reversal training for you. And so as anything in this world, habit reversal also has certain limitations. Uh, one major limitation from my perspective is that this is only a tool for behavioral modification. So from the perspective of HRT, Pooling is nothing more than an annoying habit that needs to be removed. So it will not give you a lot of psychological insight unless you make a conscious effort to analyze your logs and journal entries in that way. It will give you sort of technical skills and it will give you a practical solution, but it will not treat any underlying causes. Do you really need the additional insight? And do you really need to understand what causes pooling? Uh, the answer I have to give you is yes or no. Uh, yes and no. There are some people that really don't care, that explicitly, I think, avoid thinking about their psyche and that all they want is a way to reduce pulling and then habit reversal training is perfectly okay for that. There are people who want to start with HRT and then slowly when they get things under control and when they feel more stable, they kind of want to go deeper. So it's very individual. Personally, not because I'm a therapist, but also as a, as a, as a human being, I like to know the why as much as that's possible. So I would always go down that road, but I don't think it's always necessary to, in some cases when, when hair pulling is related to trauma or to specific family dynamics, it really does help to know how it developed and why. Otherwise, it, I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but, this, but it is worth mentioning that this is a huge limitation of habit reversal training. Uh, so we will be going to the Q&A part now, so you can still ask questions, of course. Uh, but before we do, let me just briefly read, read this about uh, trick stop since they're, they're giving us this space, I might as well give them some space. So as you know from, from my, my webinar now, it's a form of therapy based on, on HRT and ACT or ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. So both types of treatments have been empirically validated. So we know that they work for hair pulling. It takes at least eight weeks to complete the program. Just please remember this. It takes at least eight weeks to complete the program. For some reason, people know this and then they register and often tell me, yeah, but I'm just gonna do it really quickly. So it's technically not possible to finish it faster because it's made that way that you need eight weeks. People will often choose to stay longer or they will stretch out certain parts of the program depending on how fast they change or how much time they have to devote to the program. But eight weeks is something that you should 
sort of think about. Um, you get professional guidance every step of the way because you're assigned a therapist you can correspond with even daily if you like, or at least on weekdays daily. Um, you can basically do it from your home and it's, and it's really completely anonymous. So I, I, since I work also as a therapist in TrickStop, when I get new clients, the only information about them that I have is their username, so nothing else. I don't have access to your first name or last name. Some people choose to share it, other, or gender, or, or sex, or, or anything, really. Age, nothing. So you can choose exactly the type of information that you want to provide, which in the beginning I thought was a little excessive, but now I've grown to appreciate this, because this is a level of anonymity that I think even face-to-face -face therapy cannot give you. And of course, because it's done in writing, it's done online, it's really much more affordable than, than standard forms of, 